Well, I'm excited. I'm really excited to share with you this morning. Uh, I don't know if you're anything like me, um, but my Instagram has me on lock. Like, okay, this is like a six-year-old lady's QVC commercial, okay? This is like the 12-year-old's Toys R Us magazine. Like, I remember getting those things, and I was like, they know everything I want. Everything I want is in this. And now, you know, my Instagram has been like really killing it lately. I just have to say. I'm like, I wish this thing could shop for me. I wish this thing could like make friends for me. I'm just like, this is like suggested friends. I'm like, yeah, these people are sick. Like, let's go. Like, this thing's on. And uh, one of my most recent Instagram follows is like probably one of my favorites of all time. And it's this 15-year-old kid and his name's Jack. Now, Jack popped up on my Instagram reels one day because he was taking an ice bath. How many of you have heard of an ice bath, a cold plunge? Okay, it's like, it's kind of the thing right now. It's this, it, what skim milk was to like 2014, ice baths are to 2024, you know what I'm saying? So this guy, Jack, he gets in this Rubbermaid tote. It's just this tiny little Rubbermaid tote. And he's like 15, you know, pretty big kid. And so like he doesn't fit in this Rubbermaid tote very well at all. But he fills it up with water. He pours some ice in it. And the video that I see, he goes, this is day one of taking an ice bath every day until next Christmas or until I stop. And I just like, I loved it. I was like, or until I stop. And then he's like, all right, this is day 20 of doing an ice bath every day until next Christmas or until I stop. And I just like, I loved it. Every morning I would wake up, do the little devotional, check out Jack's page. And then it was like every day until I stop. And then Jack like started to get really big. And people were like, he was starting to get brand deals. Like, people were like, we want to send you a cold plunge, like, tub, all this stuff. And how many of you know fame changes people? And I'm over here like an OG, like, ah, Jack's changing, you know what I mean? And he goes and he's like, he gets this new ice bath, whatever, and I will never forget. I'm telling you, like, this sounds dramatic, and I know I'm not dramatic at all. My wife can attest to that. Um, But I, Jack's going to get an ice bath. I think we're on, like, day 40 at this point. I don't remember exact. And he's like... This is day 40 of doing an ice bath every day, full stop. And I was like, hold up. And I ran to the comment section, and everybody's like, Jack, I'm so proud of you. Like, you're going to keep going. And then he's like, this is day 41, doing an ice bath every day until next Christmas, full stop. He's like not adding the thing anymore. And so I get in the comments, and I'm like, Jack, you are my hero. You inspire me as a husband, as a pastor. And like in everything I do, I just want to be like you. And I tell you this funny story this morning, but I think so often some of us do this with God. This is day 47 of me going to church, or until I stop. This is day 320 of believing for that miracle, or until I stop. This is year 7 of me going to that job and giving God my everything when I get there, or until I stop. And you know, I think sometimes we allow disappointments and discouragements and different things in our life to cause us to stop. And I want to encourage you today that whether you're on day one of this journey with Jesus or whether you've been doing this for many, many, many years, whether you're adding the clause to the end of your intros or not, God has so much more for your life. Whether you've been in church for 18, 20, 25, 30 years, whether you just walked in here, God has so much more for you. And it's found by faith, and it's found by consistency, and it's found by time with Him. You know, the message today, it's not one that's about self-help. It's not about, here's how you look inside of yourself and live the life that you want to live. No, it's saying like, God, I'm going to locate myself in your grace. I'm going to locate myself in your position, because I know that outside of myself, I I will add the clause. There's probably going to come a day that it's like, Jack knew. He was like, yeah, well, I might hit day 200, and I live in Columbus, Ohio, and it's really cold outside, so it might just come a day where I don't want to get in the ice bath. So I'm just going to let people know, like, it's day 200 or until I stop, like, just in case to protect myself. And I want to encourage somebody, like, You don't have to add the clause today. You don't have to add the or until I stop. There's so much more that's over your life. So this morning, we're going to dive into this. We've been in a series called The Good Way Is. And this morning, I get the honor and the privilege of speaking on The Good Way Is, A Life of Devotion. 
Now, I don't know about you, but devotion is not a hot topic word among the 24-year-olds that I'm surrounded by. Um, I don't know if I've ever heard of somebody that's like walked up to me and they're fresh out of college. They're like, I'm devoted to my job. I think marriages today seem to come with options. I think that job changes are just left and right. People make friendships and then call it quits when it like gets a little rough. But how many know that there's power in a devoted life? There's power in showing up. You don't run a marathon on one week of training. You don't start a multi-million dollar business in a day. Your marriage doesn't get better just because you read one book. Your kid doesn't become respectful just because you put them in timeout once on a Tuesday afternoon. Good things take time, right? You may have heard that phrase, good things take time. I propose to you today that God things take time. That there's things in our life that are time sensitive, that God can actually only bring out through time, through faithfulness. You know, when we say like time sensitive, we always think like, oh, it's a rushing matter. I actually think that in the sense of God, that the things that are time sensitive, it means that it's going to take a little bit of time. It's just going to take a little bit of showing up. It's just going to take a little bit of consistency. It's just going to take a little bit, I'm throwing away the claws, and I'm giving you everything that I have. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'll be here. I'll be here. I'm excited to uh, speak with you on Palm Sunday because it's such a beautiful day in the story of Jesus and, and what it all means. And just to kind of set it up for you, basically this festival that is celebrated on Palm Sunday, it was the festival of the Passover. And there's a story that in the Old Testament that Jesus is like, or basically God is punishing a nation. And he says, hey, if you don't want to get punished, the punishment was the firstborn of every household was going to die. And God says, if you don't want to be punished, just make a sacrifice and put the blood over your door and then I'll pass over you. And so it was this sign for the Israelites of God passing over and forgiving them. And so we get to this place, and they're coming to celebrate this festival, and Jesus is coming as well. And at this point, the news is starting to spread about Jesus. This guy's done a lot of miracles. He's done a lot of healings. The Bible says he was healing every disease and illness and sickness. Like everything that existed on the earth, Jesus was sovereign over Jesus was ruling over. And people were starting to kind of catch wind of like, I think this guy's legit. Like it started like a fraud, but I mean, he's kind of lived up to what he said. And so I imagine, I'm I'm a big fashion guy, I like fashion. And I imagine this like the Met Gala, right? Everybody's showing out. Like all the Israelites are showing out. All the priests and all the people, you know, they're like making their travel. They're getting on their private jet. Shout out Taylor Swift. They're on the way. They're on the way to Jerusalem. Like, this is a really big deal. And Jesus is showing up. And it's like, all right, you know, he's like one of the last to walk the carpet. Everyone's like, what's Beyonce going to wear today? You know what I mean? Everybody's like, what's Jesus going to look like? And the Bible says that he comes in riding on a donkey's colt. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was the king of the world and I wanted to, like, make a statement, I'd come in on a Ferrari. Not a 95 Buick LeSabre, you know what I mean? Shout out. I had that car like last year. That's why I say it. Um, I, I wouldn't roll in on in, in that kind of car. Like Jesus coming in like a Pontiac Grand Prix, you know what I mean? Like just straight up. Like there's so many other options, Jesus. And he rolls in on this, and, and I think it's beautiful because it's actually a fulfillment of a prophecy that's in Zechariah chapter 6. And how many of you know that sometimes God does something that we don't understand in the moment? And it takes us some hindsight. To realize like, oh, that's, that's what he was up to, right? It says in the Bible actually that the disciples, they didn't understand. They didn't understand why Jesus was doing this. They were like, dude, why do you got to do it like that? It was only after he was glorified that they realized, you know, I didn't come here today to tell you that everything's going to make sense. I didn't come here today to tell you that the trial and the disappointment and all of these things, I, I didn't come to give you a reason. I just came to say that there's coming a day. There's coming a day when Christ will be glorified, when we'll return to him and things will start to make sense. And I just felt like so heavy over my spirit. There's somebody in here today that's just like, God, I don't get it. 
Maybe somebody told you, like, there's a reason. You'll understand. Like, I'm sorry you went through that, but, like, you know, God's going to turn it around. And you're like, I'm just here confused. Like, why the donkey? You know what I mean? And I think that some of us just need to be encouraged today. Like, you, it will be revealed. In due time, God will reveal the reason why that thing happened to you. Or you went through that. Or that was so hard for you. Whatever it might be. So I just came to tell somebody that God knows what he's up to. God knows what he's doing with your life. And he can be trusted. So we get this whole story from Palm Sunday. And that was kind of a side point, not even the message. So we'll get back. Um, basically... Jesus is coming in, he's riding on a donkey, all the people are like, oh my gosh, this is Jesus. They start laying down palm branches, like basically worshiping him. They're shouting, Hosanna, which means save, like save us God, save us God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you have this beautiful, beautiful moment. And then right after the end of that passage, in John chapter 12, we're going to pick up in verse 20. It says this, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. And Jesus replied with this. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. And anyone who hates their life, in other words, anyone who despises their life in this world, will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Point number one is this, devotion begins at the burial. Devotion begins at the burial. You know, I grew up in Gilbert, Arizona, and when you're a, when you're a second grader in Gilbert, Arizona, and you go on a field trip, there's not many places to go. Um, so you either go to the science center, the movie theater, or like a gold mine. Those are like the three options. Uh, if you have kids in the Gilbert School System, get ready. You're going to go to a lot of gold mines. Um, but I remember being in second grade, and we would go on these gold mine field trips, and every field trip chaperone knows that, like, the worst place on the field trip is the gift shop. Like, if the kids find the way to the gift shop, it's all over. They've got $5 in their pocket and a whole lot of belief, and they're going to buy that whole store with 5 bucks. And so I was one of these kids, found my way to the gift shop at the gold mines. And also, they're, they're not real gold mines, by the way. They're, it's like fake gold. Um, but anyways, so we go to the gift shop, and they would always have, I'm sure you've seen these, like the bags of rocks, right? You can buy a bag. It's like overpriced. It's like $27 a bag for like this big. And you can fill it up with rocks. And I, like, that was my favorite thing. I don't know why. I feel like everyone went through a rock collecting phase. Um, anybody with me? But I remember that. I would go buy the rocks, and my favorite rock was petrified wood. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I was like, this is like wood, but it's a rock, but it's a rock, but it's wood. I was like, this thing is so cool. And I was obsessed. I loved them. I feel that whole bag with petrified wood. And um, we were on a plane the other day, and you know when you're on a plane, like, you don't have much you can do other than, like, scroll your camera roll, listen to your voice memos, or just think. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm just going to think because I went through the whole camera roll already. So I started thinking, and I thought about petrified wood. I was like, oh, that's funny. It's like I never actually thought about what causes the wood to be petrified, right? Because there's a lot of wood in the world. Like there's a lot of trees that fall down, and like there's not a lot of petrified wood. At least I didn't think so in second grade. So I started doing research. You know the thing that causes petrified wood to become a rock? It has to be buried. I was like, wait, so this thing happens underground? <laughs> like, this is cool. Basically, what happens is when petrified wood, or when wood is buried underground in the right soil, in the right condition, there's groundwater that only exists underground. And it has certain properties that actually flow through the wood, flow through the holes in the wood. And the wood actually takes on the properties of the water, and it becomes a whole new substance. You might see where I'm going with this, but 
on the surface, things begin to rot. And this season of your life, the thing that you're going through has the power to either rot you or establish you. You can either leave this season of your life more bitter, more broken, more brittle, or you can leave this season of your life more in love with the word of God, more enamored by the Holy Spirit, more empowered to live the life that you want to live. When our devotion's on the surface, when we live our life for other people, weather gets right to us. Weather wears us out. When I pray but only in public, when I give but only when people see it, when I'll serve but I prefer a visible position, when we live our life on the surface, the surface rots the very thing that God's put in your heart. But under the surface, when I find the secret place with God, when I start to pray things that nobody else knows I'm praying, when I start to serve in ways that nobody else sees, when I start to be generous with my finances in ways that nobody will ever know, that's where God can petrify me. That's where God can solidify me. God blesses the burial. Did you know that God actually wants to solidify your faith? The Bible says multiple times that God wants to give us an assurance of salvation. In Hebrews chapter 6, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. I think there's too many Christians that walk around and they're like, yeah, I think God loves me. Like, I, I don't really know, but I think he does. Like, no, he does. Oh, I think I was supposed to maybe do this, so I'm going to like, no, you were. I came to encourage someone today that night that you had in church, it wasn't just a feeling. That word that God spoke to you wasn't just like an idea from your own imagination. He actually wants to establish that in your life. He actually wants to put faith into that in your life. But here's what you have to do. You have to bury it. You have to hide it with God. You have to put it in the ground and allow God to breathe upon it. Allow God to speak over it. Maybe that idea that you got yesterday isn't to tell somebody today. Put it in the ground. Let God speak to it. Let God develop it. I think we live our life on the surface and we live our life just wanting people to like see or we get a word from God for somebody and we like run to tell them right then and there. Like put it underground. Just let God develop it. Let God breathe upon it. God blesses the burial. Your life should always be a blessing to others, but it will never be established by them. The life that you live should always bless other people. But they won't establish it. They don't establish it. You know, there's a lot of people that they get a dream from God and they start chasing the dream. They start chasing after like, God told me when I was this, this years old that I'm going to do this one thing and they start chasing that instead of just putting it in the ground and seeking God. Seeking for God to develop it, seeking for God to petrify it, seeking for God to solidify it, and then he's going to reveal it. Because here's the thing, God things don't stay buried. God things don't stay underground. This season of your life or the things that you're doing, like, it's not going to stay there forever. That dream that you have for a platform, like, it, it might not be there forever, but put it underground and then God will lift it up. And when he lifts it up, it'll be a rock. It'll be steady. It'll be secure. The things that come up and the circumstances that go to and fro are not going to be the thing that break you down. The burial is not defeat. The burial is discipline. The burial is self-denial. It's in the burial that God gives me the assurance of the things that I've hoped for. I believe that God wants to give people an assurance of the things that you've hoped for. You're believing for that one thing over your life. I believe God wants to give you an assurance of it today. It's not just a cute idea or something that maybe will happen one day if God does it. I believe he wants to give you an assurance. I said it, I will do it. But that only happens underground. So I'll be here. Underground. In the secret place with God. Praying when I feel like it and when I don't. Believing God when it feels possible and when it doesn't. Serving when I was up late the night before or when I got to sleep in. 
I'll be here packing down when I've got lunch plans or when I don't. This is what it means to put our dream in the ground. Say, yeah, yeah, God, I got things, but they're here, so you bring them up. We allow God to bless the burial. But in the burial is a sacrifice. You know, I'm one to be very fond of spending money. Um, it's something I love to do. <laughs> I just do. No matter where, we, it's like, why would we go on a trip if we're not just going to, like, spend? You know what I mean? It's what I'm here for. Like, let's go to the mall. Um, and I remember when I was in university, I was actually talking to my little brother about this the other day. But when I was in university, I, like, if there was something that I really, really wanted, I would just do this calculation in my head of, like, this is how many lunches I have to skip in order to save enough money to buy that thing. So there were days, I mean, I'm going 27 days, no Chipotle for lunch, so I can get that shoe. Or like, I'm going like five days, no breakfast, no lunch, I'm calling it a fast, but like really I'm just saving, and I'm like, I gotta get this thing. I'd tell you a funny story, but I realized then that the things that I know I really want are gonna cost me something. I could have got a cheaper shoe, I could have got, you know, the one from Walmart instead of the one that I knew I really wanted. I could have got the Amazon dupe, but I knew what I really wanted. And I knew to get it was going to cost something. Jesus, when he's going to the cross, he knew what I really want. Hearts, souls, lives. It, it's going to cost something. You know, sacrifice and discomfort are not signs that you're outside of God's will for your life. I think that so often we go through seasons that are just uncomfortable and we're like, well, guess this wasn't for me. He must have got it wrong, you know. Like uh, my friend Noah's here in the front row. His birthday is on Monday. And Noah, Noah told me for my birthday I want to go to the gym with you. It's like, dude, Why? Just, get, just ask for a gift. <laughs> I hate the gym. But if I walk into the gym and I'm like, ah, sorry, it's just uncomfortable. It's just not for me, you know? I'll never get better. I'll never be developed. Sometimes it's early mornings. Sometimes it's late nights. Sometimes it means less alone time or less nights out with the guys. Because the things that I know I really want are going to take a sacrifice. For myself, I've, uh, I've been in church like since I was like five years old, since I can remember. Church kid, love the church. And I remember when I was 14 years old at a youth camp over the summer, it was the first time I felt God directly call me to ministry. And like, hey, not just like you're going to do ministry, but you're going to preach the word of God. You're going to lead worship and you're going to do all these things. And he was like, and you might even do it vocationally sometimes. And I was like... Let's freaking go. This is amazing. Like everybody else has to go to like their finance jobs or work at the restaurants. I get to hang out with Christians all day long. Like this is amazing. I know some of y'all are laughing because you know it's not as real. I was 14 and I was like, this is going to be the best time of my life. I'm so thankful, God, you're amazing. And then I realized, oh, there's some mean people here. Like... There were people that came after the dream of God in my heart. There were people that didn't really believe in it the way I thought they would. Remember, I was 18 years old sitting in a car and my pastor was screaming at me, telling me, you're a fraud. You gave up on this thing. We put so much into you and you're just going to throw it all away. I said, no, sir, I'm following God. And I don't know what you want to say. I had people come in and try to discredit this thing. I had people come in and try to discredit the thing that I had put in the ground. And I remember about two years ago, we were sitting in a park with Pastors Adam and Juliet, and they said, hey, we're going to start a church. Are you in? And we were like, yeah, right in the park, right then and there. And I got a coffee with a friend like a week later. He's running me through all the things that he's gone through in church, all the names, all the stories, all the, and they're all valid. I'm not here to tell you today that the things that have happened to you or the things that you've gone through are invalid or they weren't hurtful. No, 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 no. But he's sitting here running me through all these things and he's like, so what about you? And I was like, well, I got my list, but we're going to plant a church. 
We're going to commit to this thing. And you know what I heard? Protect your heart. Watch out for yourself. Like, it's, it's just, it might happen again. Like, go in guarded. You know, like, just, just look out for, for the people. You know what I mean? And I walked into this, and they told me not to give it another run. I had people that loved God, people that I trusted that were like, no, 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 it's not worth it. Just go, just go attend somewhere. Like, just go be comfortable. They told me to come to church and to serve and to lift my hands was naive. I was just wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, like, didn't know what was going on. And I know I'm young, but I knew. I knew what this whole thing's about. And I know there's many of you in the room. You understand. You know this isn't perfect. And God forbid that it was. We wouldn't need him. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important. That's why the help of God is so important in our lives. But I remember being in a night of worship. And I watched a friend of mine who was in front of me. He didn't know I was there. And he was in front of me and he was worshiping. And literally the week before that, we had had all of these conversations. And he was like, I just don't know if life's worth living. Genuinely. And he was like, I don't know about the church. I don't know about God. I don't, n- none of this stuff. I just don't get it. Don't, don't understand. A week later, we're at this worship night. He's in front of me, like, losing his mind undignified before God. And I remember sitting there looking at him and being like, he'll learn. He'll get it. Like, one day he's going to have that conversation that I had, and it'll fade. Like, there's no way that he's going to be able to live like this. Like, he'll get it one day. And I think sometimes we walk in church and we think that way. Like, oh, that person in the front row with their hands in the air or on their knees before God, like, it's just naive. It's cute. It's like when someone calls you a buddy and pats you on the head. It's like, they'll get it, you know, just spend a little more time and they'll get hurt too. And the Holy Spirit so kindly but so directly said to me, Connor, that's not naive, that's strength. It's not naive of me to show up in church and lift my hands and lift my voice and declare hope and freedom and life and joy and good things over the church. That takes strength. That's not naive. It's not naive to still believe that the church is God's mission and plan for the world. It's not naive to believe that the dream that you had is, is wasted. It's strength. It takes strength to show up here. Don't neglect that. Yeah, it is hard to go to church sometimes. It takes strength. It is hard to show up and serve. It takes strength. And if it didn't, I'd wonder if it's worth having. You know, the sacrifice requires strength. Jesus' sacrifice took strength. On the cross, he had every opportunity. He had all power in his hand to just call that one quits. Gave it a good run. Was up here for a few hours. But he saw it all the way through. So in the example of Jesus, I'll be here. Lifting my hands when I feel like it and when I don't. I'll be here surrendering myself to God over and over and over again. I'll be here calling him worthy and holy even when it doesn't look like it. I'll be here acknowledging that he's the God over all things. That he holds all authority in his hand. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, I'll be here. So I invite the team up. I want to close the message with this point. It's all for the glory. You know, there's a really beautiful passage of uh, literature in the church. It's called the Westminster Catechism. And in it, it says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. If you came in here wondering, like, what's life all about? I had, like, I'm doing this thing, going to this job, I got this degree, but, like, what's it all about? Your purpose, your end, your aim, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In John chapter 12, the part that we didn't read, after verse 26, it says this in verse 27 and 28. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? This is Jesus talking. Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. My friends, this is for his glory. This is for his fame. This is for his notoriety. 
This is for his name and not my own. You know, you thought that this whole message that I'll be here was about you. It was about your commitment. It was about your strength. No, no, no. I'll be here is God's word to you. I'm not standing up here just because I had enough faith or I said the right prayer or I did the right thing in the right moment or I kept myself in church. No, 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 no. I'm here because in every season of my life, God's been there. I'm here because Jesus looked down from heaven and he said, whatever you go through, whatever you encounter, I'll be there. The things that you don't understand. In the past, I was there. In the future, I'll be there. This is the thing about God. I'm not here to tell you that you can just figure it out. Like, look on the inside. It's in there. You know, you got strength. You don't. If this were up to me, I would have given up. But it's not up to me. It's up to God. God's glory is his own. It's his initiative. It's his power. Jesus says this, I'll be seated at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on your behalf. My friend, you don't have what it takes. You don't have what it takes to live the life that God's asked you to live. You don't have what it takes to stay devoted to all of these different things that he's put in front of you. But you know what you do have? You have the spirit of God living on the inside of you, empowering you, strengthening you, upholding you, giving you wisdom and direction and strength when you need it. Can we all stand across the room this morning?